Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. So it seems that my luck with spectrum analyzers is not uh, is, is not getting any better. I, I went to uh, I went to a ham fest a couple days ago and I bought a um, I, I bought a, a step attenuator. I wanted to categorize it uh, over the frequency range. I was told it was good out to uh, 2.5 gigahertz, and so I went to um, grab my uh, Spectrum analyzer here, the 8595E uh, spectrum analyzer. Um, as you know, uh, this one is the one that I upgraded uh, a couple years ago with the tracking generator option. And I wanted to use that to categorize the um, step attenuator to, uh, to see how flat it was out to uh, the, the frequency range was specified as two and a half gigahertz. And when I went to turn the unit on, um, I got uh, some garbled screen and saw that uh, the uh, the instrument had lost all of its um, calibration data. So we'll take a look at that in a minute, and I already know why. It's um, a pretty simple thing, but I'm uh, going to have to figure out what to do there. So I thought um, when I had done the last uh, few videos on this unit that I had backed up the calibration data. And if I did, I can't find it anywhere. Uh, so I, as far as I know now, do not have the calibration data. So I'm going to have to figure out how to uh, recreate the calibration data uh, to get this unit working again. Uh, but uh, anyway, we'll take a look at this unit. I've gone ahead and got it on the bench here down out of the shelf where it normally sits uh, just because it's, uh, it's you have to move stuff around to get it out. So I've gone ahead and done that and got the cover off because we'll have to have the cover off. But uh, we'll take a uh, overlook uh, view of this unit again and talk about some things. And then uh, we'll power it up and start taking some measurements and we'll go from there. I'm not really sure uh, where this video is going to go at the moment um, because sometimes these things are, are, are not as complex as far as getting in the in the in into the... Um, hardware side of it usually it's a, a lot of software things but we'll just see what uh, we'll see what happens in this video along the way let's take a closer look at the unit you remember this is the unit that uh that was flooded out when my basement flooded a few years ago and i've had it uh apart since then and done a little bit of cleaning but um since i got it on the bench i think what i may do now is go ahead and uh, break it down uh further to get to get some more cleaning done um, there's a couple of spots that I see are uh, are still need some some attention in here, especially down in the RF section. It looks uh, particularly uh, sort of dirty and dusty down in there. Um, some of the board uh, areas uh, down in here in the card cage you can see. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and since I've got it out now, really take it, uh, break it down, and uh, get some cleaning done on the unit. Flip it over here and we'll look at the bottom side. All right, so here's the bottom side of the unit. And as you can see here, I have removed the uh, backup battery because that is the problem. Uh, so we had the had the battery here and looks like it was uh, October of 1994. Uh, last time we checked this, uh, this uh, spectrum analyzer uh, a couple years ago, I checked the battery voltage it was good, uh, 3.6 volts. And now it is completely dead. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just hook that up here to So we've got it hooked up here onto the multimeter and we see that we've got uh, negative 73 millivolts. So this battery is now uh, toast. Now I've gone ahead and ordered a replacement battery uh, surprisingly these this exact battery is available on uh, from Mauser it's a uh, model number there is a TL5104 with the leads attached uh, it is available from Mauser it's pretty cheap it's only like seven or eight bucks but uh, they do have it marked as uh, not recommended for new design so I think that that means they're probably uh, selling out their current stock and they're not going to be restocking that battery so uh, if you need to get a replacement battery for one of your uh, spectrum analyzers, this might be now uh, a time to do that. They still had 
a few hundred in stock. So I, that uh, is, I haven't got it yet. It's uh, today's Labor Day, so it's probably not going to arrive till Wednesday, I think. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and break this scope, uh, this spectrum analyzer down and try to get some cleaning done. And then we'll get it all put back together. And once it's put back together, we'll power it up and we'll look at the symptoms, uh, what the analyzer is doing. And we'll look at the uh, tr uh, troubleshooting manual, service manual, and see what it recommends that we do. Uh, because you can regenerate the calibration constants. Uh, it just uh, takes uh, some equipment and a lot of time. And I imagine it's uh, probably going to take a lot of time. So. All right, and here we are again. Um, got the spectrum analyzer put back together, and we're looking at the um, cow signal out back into the input. Uh, I'll tell you what I found uh, with the spectrum analyzer, and we'll go into some more detail here in a minute. But um, the first thing we'll do is take a look at the. Um, we'll put a signal in again, just like we did, and or like I did in, in the video previous, and we'll check to make sure we've got my. Uh, sweep generator set up over here. So we'll put a signal in there and check the amplitude and um, response there on the screen. And we can look at the um, Cal data here. So we'll put the passcode in here and we'll take a look at the Cal data. Uh, here's the cal data that we got. Sorry about the flicker on the screen. I know it's got to do with the refresh rate on the CRT there. Uh, we're able to get everything to pass. Uh, frequency, amplitude, uh, Yigtune filter, everything passed. Uh, did the tracking generator too. We'll talk about some things we did there and we'll maybe do some, um, uh, some look at some demonstration stuff because I know uh, some people have asked questions about uh, when upgrading these to a uh, with a tracking generator option if they weren't factory fit so we'll look at that maybe in a little more detail here in a little bit later on this video here uh, and uh, let's see where it was yep so our last cowl was uh, I just ran a cowl uh, this morning and everything uh, was able to pass all right so we'll put that back into uh, preset mode here let's see we've got uh, so now we've got uh, no errors showing up on the screen here. Uh, we'll look at one more thing. All right, we'll look at one more thing here. We'll look at the options we've got uh, installed there. We'll take this, disconnect that. And we can see that we've got uh, the fast ADC uh, gate, uh, which is 105. We've got the uh, tracking generator showing there and then the uh, firmware. So those are the options. Uh, for this unit. All right, we're set up now with the uh, Sweet Gen, and we're going to be on the uh, 2 to 6.2 gigahertz range, and we'll just be, uh, I'll be adjusting it in the uh, continuous wave mode here, and we'll look at uh, three points, we'll look at two gigs, uh, four gigs, and we'll take it up to six gigahertz, and we'll just look at the um, reading here on the display. We'll compare that to, I've got this going through a, a splitter and we'll look at the, uh, we'll compare this going into the spectrum analyzer to going into the power meter and up there on the display. So right now we're at uh, two gigahertz uh, on our uh, marker and you can't see it because it's right back there, but I've got it set at two gigahertz and we're looking at that. I've got this on a peak track here and we're seeing it's a minus, we'll say at minus 0.2 uh, dBm. And on the power meter, we're showing a positive 0.6 dBm. So we've got about a 0.8 uh, dBm delta there uh, from what our spectrum analyzer is reading and our power meter. So we'll take this on up and we'll raise this up to uh, four gigahertz. All right, so now we're sitting at uh, about 4 gigahertz there, and we're looking at uh, a power level of about 0.5 dBm, and the 
power meter shows a point eight, say we'll say point eight five looks like about the, the highest there. So that, again, we're looking at uh, so now a little bit smaller delta, about a point three five uh, deep dBm delta. And I'm going to go ahead and take this up to uh, six gigahertz. Now this uh, sweep generator is not the flattest uh, sweep, sweep generator out there, but um, that's the only thing I have that'll get, that'll get frequencies in this signals in this high of frequency range. All right, uh, so now we're at uh, six gigahertz and we're looking at uh, about a 0.8 uh, dBm there and the power meter shows a 1 dBm so 0.2 dBm delta so we started off with about a 0.8 dBm and then we got to about a 0.35 dBm and then a 0.2 dBm so the amplitudes are a little off uh, compared to uh, you know comparing the two readings and I think that is because, uh, you know, I lost the correction constants for this uh, spectrum analyzer uh, because I, I didn't back them up. So that's a, that's a lesson there. Uh, if you have one of these, make sure you back up your correction constants. And one of those in there is for correcting the attenuator flatness. And I looked at the service manual. There's a way to recreate the attenuator flatness readings, but... Uh, you need either a um, a sweep generator, it's a, a three 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 five sweep generator, which I don't have, or you need um, basically a set of precision attenuators, and you can use a different uh, signal source. And I just from sort of reading it, I haven't really dug into it, but I don't have the precision attenuators either. So the qu I'm questioning as to uh, if I don't have the right equipment, I, I could possibly do some other method but I don't know that it's gonna get me any better than what I've uh, got right now. If I get the equipment or I find a way to do it uh, reliably, then you can uh, look for a video on that. But as for now, I'm not going to do that. So I'm assuming that that's what the, the, the amplitude discrepancy is uh, for this uh, spectrum analyzer right now. So that uh, RAM battery is, on, is located on the um, this is the A16, yeah, A16 board, which is the CPU processor board. And as you can see now, this is a different board. And there's at least two different versions of this board. This is the newer board, uh, which has a different type of uh, RAM battery uh, system than what my old one had. So my old unit had uh, one of these, uh, look, looks like a AA battery type RAM battery that was uh, soldered onto the board. The new, the new RAM batteries are on this little daughter board here, and they look like um, like coin cell type batteries. So I'm going to have to figure out where to get that battery from. I ordered one of those initially to replace on my, uh, on my old uh, A16 board, but my A16 board died, and that's why I have a new board in here, uh, which has the new battery on it. So that... Uh, you know, it's was, it was pretty uh, uneventful. And what happened was, is I had, uh, and somewhere in the process of uh, cleaning the unit or just because it's an older unit, um, uh, the, pro the processor board died and I wasn't getting any video on the screen. What I would get on the CRT is just the text here when you turn the uh, unit on that says they're using default cows. That's the only thing I'd get was the text. I wouldn't get any other um I wouldn't get any of the spectrum plot or anything else to come on the screen. And when you hit the preset button, that message goes would go away, and then I have a black screen with nothing on it at all. And what I found, there's a section in the manual for troubleshooting the video. Uh, it's going to have you um, check for, well, it has you connect an auxiliary monitor to the monitor output, which is here, but I don't have a uh, monitor that uses um, this type of input. This is not a like an XY input. It's a composite video monitor. I don't have something to connect it to, uh, but I was able to put it to the oscilloscope and see that I was getting a video signal out. Uh, but it has the service manual has you uh, probe here for the video signal. So this is the uh, connector here 
that supplies the video signal from the processor board to the CRT display. And I probed this here and I found that uh, one of the uh, signals was incorrect. And here's this, uh, this page from the service manual where it talks about uh, checking the uh, signals. And the one I was, incor was getting incorrect was this, um, this uh, uh, horizontal sync signal. So I was getting uh, the 15.75 kilohertz TTL signal, but I was only getting uh, five microseconds uh, pulses instead of 10 microseconds. Uh, so I think I was, I, was missing, uh, I was missing half of the video of, this, of the video signal there. And I also had, so on the old board, there's a row of LEDs that is lit up that is here and they're supposed to give you uh, error codes. The LEDs are supposed to light up for uh, error codes and I had one of the LEDs, I think it was LED, uh, the 13th LED, which is the last four are for the uh, video section and that was lit up. And I don't know who put this label on here, but um, uh, it says it's a uh, uh, 6820, 68230U57, which is the the big uh, integrated circuit just right behind here, is what that LED corresponds to. But anyway, so the la like I said, the last four are uh, correspond to the video section, and one of them was lit. So I knew I had a problem in the video, and I think one of the video, I believe these uh, chips right here, U305 and U306, are the video uh, RAM chips and I think one of these may have uh, may have died on my old board uh, so it was I th think that's the problem I didn't really uh, dig into it because this is very difficult to to uh, tr to troubleshoot with the, with just the way it's all sandwiched in here and I knew I had another board all right so this is a this is my parts analyzer here. Uh, I bought this unit uh, shortly after uh, my basement flooded back in 2019, uh, sort of as like, a, I guess, sort of like an impulse uh, in case I couldn't get my other one working. This one, I found this one on eBay. It was relatively cheap uh, and the seller said it was working. So I bought it. Turns out it doesn't work at all, but it's okay because I got the other one working and I got this parts unit and I've actually used, as you can see, some parts from it. So, um, this is a, uh, 8594E, so it only has, it goes to, uh, 2.9 gigahertz. It doesn't have the 6.5 gigahertz, uh, band range, but, uh, it's got the, uh, so it's got my old, this is the old, uh, A16 processor board from the other spectrum analyzer. I put it all back in here because... The best way to store spare parts is to keep the unit put together um, instead of having them all strewn all over the place. But here's the row of LEDs that the uh, older boards had. And like I said, this one, the 13th one in was lit. It's showing that error code here and then the, the uh, video uh, rams there. So I think one of those chips ate itself and the board died. So that was the problem. And so once I replaced the... Uh, processor board because this is where the calibration constants are stored and my the replacement board had a good RAM battery so it retained the calibration constants for this unit that it was installed in. Those calibration constants are probably are going to be set for uh, 2.9 a 2.9 gigahertz unit uh, because that's what they were set up for in the factory and the unit I put it in is in a 6.5 gigahertz so I think that uh, when I go above uh, about, uh, I think when I, as I go higher in the frequency, the calibration may be a little off, but I don't really have a good way to restore those calibration constants right now. But uh, for now, it's accurate enough for anything I want to use it for. Uh, I'll just have to know that if I really want very, very accurate within less than, um, uh, less than one dB, uh, range, then I'll, I may have to find another method to take those readings. But uh, anyway, so yeah, this is my parts unit. And like I said, I've, I've already taken parts off. So now this has got a bad A16 board in it. And the, the CRT is good. So that's good. So I've got a uh, good uh, CRT module 
that uh, that works. And actually, this one has the, the burn in on this one's not quite as bad as my uh, 6.5 gig unit. It has uh, much much more burn in on the screen. But uh, you know, replace the power switch. This is the old power switch that wasn't working in the other unit. Uh, we did that on a video uh, a few years ago. And uh, let's see. Uh, power supply has been is pulled out and we'll look at that uh, power supply here. I'm going to uh, take that apart and we'll talk about the power supply next because these these uh, units have a very complicated power supply and HP uh, didn't do anybody any favors by choosing the power supply they chose for this unit uh, because it's just very difficult to repair. But we'll get into that here in a little bit. We'll uh, delve into that power supply there. Uh, the RF section here, as you can see, uh, this unit does not have the tracking generator option and it's uh, the RF section is much more uh, open there. So for the units that don't have the tracking generator, look down there. So that uh, down there is a uh, RF isolator and then the blue a uh, little block in there is a directional coupler. So if you don't have the tracking generator installed, uh, you won't have the LO distribution amplifier, uh, but the analyzer still needs to branch off the LO signal uh, for multiple paths. So they use a um, directional coupler and then they take the coupled output port and use that to branch off for the rest of the unit uh, but when you put the tracking generator in, you have a distribution amplifier that then splits the LO signal into three paths uh, so that you have your main LO path, your secondary LO path, and then your um, LO uh, on the uh, output on the rear of the instrument. So it splits it into three different sources. Um, but like I said, this one, and this, this, this one also has, I think this is the fast ADC card. So this one has that on it too. All right, so let's take a look at the uh, tracking generator uh, option here a little more. We'll do some um, sort of just put it in service and and we'll look at the uh, power level too. And I'll talk about uh, one, of, one of the adjustments that you had to make when if you uh, put in or replace a tracking generator module. Um, so we'll look at more of the um, setup and then the um, testing on that generator, on that tracking generator. Uh, for getting for this unit to get it up and running so you know uh, hardware real quick we'll just look at it again you know you've got to have the control board here which goes into the card cage and there's uh, pieces that go into the uh, rf front end here's the uh, attenuator for the tracking generator here's this piece right here uh, you can't see it but uh, behind the uh, behind the dual band mixer is the distribution amplifier that um is a new piece that's added which uh, takes your uh, LO from the YIG tuned oscillator and splits it into uh, a couple of different branches to run the tracking generator and give you uh, the LO uh, first LO out on the back as well as uh, send the LO signal throughout the rest of the instrument and then the actual tracking generator module which sits under uh, this piece here which is the second uh, this is the second converter and you can see it just down in uh, back in the bottom down there, you can just see it. And I'll get this pointer here and uh, try to point to it. But it's this piece down here in the bottom with these uh, little blue, you can see these little blue trim pots. That's the little uh, printed circuit board that's on top of the tracking generator module. And it actually sits down farther in. It's a, it's a enclosed uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a RF tight uh, enclosure down there. So that goes down in there. And the distribution amplifier we talked about, and there's the attenuator block which is here and then the control board here and then there's uh, a couple extra cables uh, there's a cable that you'll have to uh, fabricate that uh, comes off the 600 megahertz uh, tracking generator control here which is this cable here and then there's the cable that gives you your uh, first LO out here which you'll have to fabricate and that runs to the back and of course there's a couple of smaller interconnecting cables which you'll also have to fabricate it and I talked about um, some of those in, in my other videos there. All right, so once we've got that set up, important thing to note. All right, so we're looking at the uh, dis uh, display right here. I'm gonna remove this. There's a, um, 
on the back for your first LO out, there's a there's a um, 50 ohm terminator. And it's important to have that on. I'm gonna take this off and I'll show you why. So now we get a LO unlevel. So when you put, uh, when you have this uh, option in, you need to make sure that you terminate that uh, LO, that LO out signal. And I'll put that uh, terminator back on and you saw that the LO unlevel went away because you'll get that uh, error signal if you take that off uh, on the back there. So once we get the tracking generator installed, there's two adjustments that you need to make to set it up. And there's two, uh, before you install the uh, distribution amplifier, so when you get the distribution amplifier, it's just a gold, it'll be like a gold, uh, gold block, and there'll be two numbers printed on the front of it. There will be a uh, gate bias and a LO sense value. And I made these little labels here because once you install the distribution amplifier and you put it all back in, you are not gonna be able to get and look in there and see it. So when you do that and you install that distribution amplifier, make sure you take note of those uh, voltage values because you'll need them later on to set the distribution amplifier up. And if you don't, you're gonna have to take the whole thing apart in order to get those numbers. So uh, I made some labels up to put here uh, it's not a great place to put it on power supply because uh, this might get replaced. But uh, I got another label that I put, uh, this identical label, I stuck it to the bottom of, of this unit on the chassis. So I'll have, uh, if this ever gets taken out and replaced, it'll be somewhere else. All right, so you get these numbers here. Uh, the first thing you'll do is you'll take a uh, voltage reading on, uh, there's two test points here. There is a uh, gate bias, which is this GB pin here and then so you'll take a voltage reading from this gate bias uh, compared it to the analog ground point there and you'll adjust the gate bias pot which is right here and on your DC voltmeter and you set it for a value of uh, minus uh, well in my case minus 650 millivolts but whatever your gate bias value is you set it to that and uh, the service manual tells you how to do this and it has you put the instrument in a, in a certain um, in, in, a, in a particular condition first uh, before you make these uh, readings. So it's pretty much just cookbook it out of the service manual and then make the adjustment there. Uh, after you set that, then you'll set the LO sense and the LO sense is off of this test pin here. This one says LOS. And then the adjustment for that one is uh, right here, the LO amp adjustment here. So once you make the gate bias adjustment, then you'll set the LO sense for whatever the value printed on your module is. In my case, it was minus 178 millivolts. So that's how you set up the uh, LO distribution amplifier uh, once you get it all uh, wired in and connected up. So once we get it put in uh, and connected up, uh, we'll go to the uh, aux control and we'll go to, well, once you install it and you put the card in, then the unit should sense that uh, the tracking generator is present because this, this card, the control card, will tell the processor that the uh, tracking generator is present. And it should be uh, all the firmware you need because these, these units are pretty generic uh, as far as the firmware goes. They have all the firmware installed on them for a whole bunch of all the different units in this line and they're going to have the option uh, firmware there too. All you have to do is uh, basically install the hardware and the, the, the CPU will detect the hardware and it should um, it should know that it's there and it should pop populate there on the options list. But uh, we'll go to, uh, we already pressed the uh, aux control there and we'll go to tracking gen and then to in order to turn the tracking gen on off the source power uh, on off you just highlight and select the on uh, function there so we're looking at the service manual and like I just mentioned here uh, these are the I'll show you the two sections that you need to perform there uh, when you install the hardware this is uh, this is in uh, chapter 2 and it's a uh, section 22 this is the procedure that uh, it details setting up the LO distribution amplifier tells you how to set it up there and the uh, readings to make. Once you complete that section, then you may need to uh, adjust the power level 
uh, for the tracking generator and this option or this section will tell you how to do that and one thing it does tell you to do uh, because when I got when I got uh, my unit and you can see down there that uh, uh, they have some that little uh, those trim pots have some of that uh, that uh, cement on them uh, so you may have to break that loose uh, what I would recommend doing is is installing your unit and then uh, perform this section without making the adjustments first to see if adjustments necessary because just adjustment may not be necessary so I went ahead and made the adjustment you know it depends on um, you know, your needs uh, certainly for uh, like a hobby uh, type setup here it's probably not really needed but um, I went ahead and I made the adjustments anyway. Uh, so, and I'm gonna go through here and just, uh, and we'll do this. So uh, we'll put our, uh, we'll hit uh, preset on our instrument. I'm doing that right now. And then we'll go to frequency uh, minus 2001 Hertz. That's the passcode that enables you to make changes to the uh, Cal data in your spectrum analyzer. So uh, if you wanna make changes or if you wanna do uh, calibrations and change the uh, DAC values and whatnot, uh, you have to put this passcode in first to to unprotect the analyzer. And then just be aware that whenever you put in this passcode, now you've unlocked your uh, settings so you can make changes uh, and you can do them inadvertently. So I'm gonna do that now. We'll do uh, frequency and we're gonna go to uh, minus uh, 2001 hertz all right and then it will uh put you uh, it'll come up with this display here and put your center at minus two kilohertz and we'll hit uh so we'll go to cal and we'll go to more and more data there and it's going to have us it will have you go to well we'll go to default cal and what that's going to do is that going that is going to put the spectrum analyzer in a default calibration mode. So we see we're using default cals. When you get done doing this step, you'll need to uh, re-perform the cal frequency and cal amplitude on your spectrum analyzer. So uh, keep that in mind too, that if you're gonna run this section, it's going to force you to do a uh, recalibration on your unit. So if you're having problems getting these uh, cows to to uh, to take then uh, you may want to consider that if you're going to do this option here so we're using default cows now and then we're going to go to uh, so we'll go to cow again and one and two and we're going to hit uh, service diagnostic and uh, display cal data and next page and what we're looking for is an an a offset uh, of zero so that's what uh, this is looking at here uh, a offset of zero on the tracking generator readout so that's what we're looking for there all right and the next thing we'll do is we'll connect the uh, cable between the rf out and the uh, 50 or the RF out and the input. So we're gonna connect our cable between here and here. So I need to remove this uh, power meter and set that up. All right, that cable's set up now. So we're going to uh, preset the instrument and we'll do a center frequency of 300 megahertz and a span of uh, zero megahertz. So we'll go uh, preset. All right, and so you see that, uh, so we know the instruments usually use defaults because we don't have the uh, corrected uh, message showing down here, uh, letting us know that the analyzer is in a corrected mode. All right, so we'll go uh, frequency. We'll do a center frequency of 300 megahertz, and we'll do a span of zero hertz so zero span could there's also a zero span button that you can press to do that too all right uh on the analyzer uh we're going to set the bandwidth to 10 kilohertz and then we're going to turn on the tracking generator so uh i'm going to go to bandwidth 
and we're looking for a 10 kilohertz bandwidth and aux control tracking gen and we're going to put the source on and we want a power level of uh, minus 10 dBm uh, so that's what we're showing there for source power all right then we're going to depress the tracking peak all right so uh tracking peak there and we're going to wait for the peaking to complete and that peaking message will disappear all right, and that should that's an option here on the side so we'll go tracking peak and it's uh, saying I'm peaking all right and then the peaking message is gone now so we're going to continue on then we're going to uh all right so now is here we put our uh, rf power meter on here we're going to zero and calibrate the uh, power meter and put in the correction factor for 300 megahertz that's for the power sensor and then we'll connect disconnect the cable and connect the power sensor to the RF out. So just like it's showing here in the picture, and I'm not using a, uh, this is a measuring, so I'm not using that, I'm using the just a good old power meter there. So that's hooked up and I changed the cow factor there. I had still had this uh, set up for, um, I had it set for four gigahertz because that was about middle of the two to six gigahertz we were looking at earlier. So I've, I've changed the cow factor now to 300 megahertz and uh, we'll see that uh, I'm putting a power level out of minus 9.96 dB, uh, which is uh, very close to what the uh, source power says at minus 10 dBm. What I'm gonna do on the analyzer, we'll press the uh, source power on off, which is gonna uh, highlight this option and it's already there, so we really don't need to do that. But uh, we're gonna change the source power to uh, zero uh, dBm. So that's gonna raise our tracking generator power level and we'll hit the uh, single sweep, which I had time finding that one, but uh, we'll hit single sweep and it'll do uh, one sweep. And now we see that uh, it's no longer sweeping there at the bottom. And we're gonna note the uh, uh, power reading here uh, for our power meter. And here's where it talks about the compound there, new and remove the compound. And we're going to adjust, if necessary, uh, for a 0 dBm plus or minus 0 0.05 dB reading on the uh, power meter. And as we can see, that uh, the power meter there is showing a minus 0 0.03 dBm. So that's within the specification there. And here's the drawing that shows there's two pots that you need to adjust there on the uh, back end. The potentiometers are, you gotta move these cables out of the way. And there's two potentiometers down in the bottom, down in there, and you can just get to them with, uh, you need like a long uh, screwdriver, or something like, uh, like this right here, and you can get down into there and make those adjustments on those potentiometers. Uh, if you need to make the adjustment there. So, and then make sure you get on the right one. So for the uh, minus, adjust the, you're adjusting the minus 10 dB adjust uh, for a zero dB reading. So there's a zero dB adjust and a minus 10 dB adjust. So you wanna get on the minus 10 dB adjust for making this adjustment here for zero dB. And then we're gonna change the source power level to minus 10. So we're already looking at source power there. So I'm gonna uh, put in uh, 10 uh, minus dBm. So then we're showing source power minus 10 dBm. And we see on the power meter there, we're looking at uh, minus uh, 9.96 dB. So that adjustment is uh, is gonna be within spec here. And the power level, the power level is minus 9.77 dB to minus 10.23. Then the adjustment is complete. So I've, like I said, I already made this adjustment here. Uh, I made that last night, so it's uh, that adjustment's good. So once you complete that, and then if it's not within the band, then you're gonna come down and perform this uh, subsection here, which is gonna have you uh, set to minus 10 dBm and adjust. Now you're adjusting the minus 10 dB adjust uh, for a reading of minus 10 dBm plus or minus 0.1 dBm. And then you're gonna go back to zero dB, and now you're gonna adjust the other uh, potentiometer, which is the R18, that is the, um, 
zero dB adjust. So now if uh, you need to form this section when you go back to zero, then you'll adjust the other potentiometer which is the one right next to it there to make the reading of 10 of zero dBm plus or minus 0.2 dB on your power meter. And then you're gonna repeat these two steps as necessary until you can get your uh, tracking general adjusted within this, um, within the range specified here from zero to uh, within this range here. All right, so that's uh, that's how you set it up. So there's uh, those two options that are those two steps you need to run once you install the hardware, um, setting up your uh, LO distribution amplifier, and then doing the doing the um, uh, tracking generator power adjustment. So all right, so once you complete uh, your tracking generator setup, uh, you'll have to run the like I mentioned the cal frequency cal amplitude again. I've done that. Uh, always make sure that uh, you hit the cal store button when you get done, get the cal stored, and we can see now that we're showing um, the corrected uh, there on the display, letting us know that the correction factors are being applied to the unit. All right, um, the manual talks about too, uh, when you're doing uh, any work where you're having to run the, the calibration routines, uh, you always wanna run the cal frequency first uh, because um, I don't remember the, the manuals where it, but I know I've read it in the manual running the cal frequency because it can, the cal frequency can, uh, has an impact on some of the other calibration routines. So always run the cal frequency first. Uh, or if you do want to do both frequency and amplitude, you can hit this button here. It'll run cal frequency and then it'll run cal amplitude after the cal frequency. So now that we've uh, completed running the cal frequency, cal amplitude, we'll do the, uh, we'll cal the tracking generator. You got to make sure before you run the cal gen, uh, tracking gen routine that you have the source output connected to the RF input. And uh, just like before, we need to go into the, um, I wanted to put in the passcode to unlock the instrument so that we can make changes to the calibration data. So we'll do that and we'll go to the Cal menu and on the third page there's an option for Cal tracking gen. So we'll push that and it'll run the uh, tracking generator calibration team. It's, it's pretty quick. It definitely doesn't take as long as uh, some of the other ones do. As you can see my tracking generator is not particularly flat at the uh, top end of the band, there's uh, quite a bit of wiggle there. All right, uh, cow tracking gen is done. We will uh, store the cow there. All right, so now we've got our, we've reperformed our frequency amplitude calibration. We've done our tracking gen calibration stored there. And we got our uh, correction factors there displayed on the unit. All right, so I really wanted to um, take a look at the power supply, and I've been thinking about it for uh, quite a while uh, since I had to repair uh, the one in my spectrum analyzer. And I thought about doing a, I, I wish that I had done a video uh, now when I was repairing the power supply, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and kind of fill in some of this information. So this is for a the power supply module in the, um, the uh, HP 8590 series spectrum analyzers. They use these uh, power supply modules. It's a, there's a HP part number there. It's a 5062-888229 uh, power supply. It's a uh, switch mode power supply. And it's not, uh, from what I understand, it's not an HP uh, power supply. It is, uh, was basically, um, it, was, it was bought from a third party and installed in their units. So, when you get the clips for your spectrum analyzer, uh, clips are available for the HP 8590 series spectrum analyzers. I have the, I have a clip uh, of it on CD-ROM that I purchased on eBay from Artec Media. Uh, so, I mean, they are available. I don't know if they're on the internet for download, but they are available for sale uh, if you need one. Uh, but do be aware that the clip does not include any information on the power supply or the CRT a display module for those analyzers. The CRT modules are also, um, from what I understand, third-party module. So you're not going to find any schematic information. And uh, if you look on the internet, I've, I've found very little information on these power supplies. I found a lot of uh, people wanting information for them, but not a lot of information available. Um, some hand-drawn partial schematics and things like that, but nothing, uh, nothing really definitive. 
so I'm going to get into what I found and some of the notes I made uh, when I was working on this power supply and the method I used for testing it. So, uh, like I said, as I mentioned before, it's a switch mode power supply. So the, uh, the AC input is always applied to the um, power supply. And so you've always got um, a, a high voltage uh, uh, applied on the inside. The power supply is always in a standby uh, mode of operation and it's waiting for somebody to turn the analyzer on. So that was my problem with uh, when the analyzer flooded was because the power supply was, was hot and of course water and electricity don't mix and it caused a lot of damage to the power supply. Now I believe that this is the power supply from my original unit. So this is the one that I repaired. We'll find out when I open it up. Um, uh, the power supply that's in my unit now is the one that came out of that parts unit that we looked at. And I did get this uh, power supply working. Um, was able to get it working again. And I don't really remember why I didn't put it back in. Um, it may have been that, uh, um, well, I, I just, I don't know. I don't remember why I didn't put it back in. But anyway, uh, but this power supply is working and it's just a spare. And it's really a pain to, uh, you have to take the back panel off to get the unit in there just because of the, uh, clearances in the chassis so it's kind of a pain to get in and out and so that's why I haven't put it back in because I didn't want to take my uh, parts unit all the way apart just to put the power supply in uh, so it's a self-contained unit so I just left it out but anyway so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into my documentation first and then after we get into the documentation I'll take this apart and we'll look at the internals the construction how it's put together and the different uh, modules inside and what they and kind of an overview of what they do. Uh, so this document here is, uh, was the notes that I made for uh, my troubleshooting. Um, I don't know I, if there's a lot of interest. I'll put these on the on the YouTube channel for download. Um, basically, uh, it goes through some of the things that I found, uh, some of the drawings I made of the power supply unit, and. Uh, and some of the readings that, that I took of the power supply. Um, uh, this front part's here, just kind of a, uh, a summary of what I did for repair and some of the things I did. Um, replaced uh, Q120, 130, and 131, which I think are the main switching FETs. They were all shorted. Uh, replaced the FET drivers, uh, U120 and 130. Those are the FET gate drivers. They were shorted. Uh, Replaced a VR140 uh, with a, a 1N7247B uh, Zener diode. Um, and then cleaned all the, the boards were all cleaned. Uh, and then after replacement of the fail components, looks like uh, I tested it in standby and then under load uh, by connecting to the spectrum analyzer and power supply. It looks like it started up with all of the proper voltages. So I was able to uh, repair the uh, power supply. All right, uh, so here is some uh, test setup. This is the way I uh, test uh, set up my power supply for testing. When we get into the unit and start taking it apart, you'll understand why I did this way. But I, uh, in order to uh, get the boards to connect and have them open and available for testing, I uh, I fanned out the. Um, this is the main power board here picture and the control board here, and I fanned them out with some. Uh, short uh, jumper wires so that uh, could sort of spread them out and was able to take readings. Also, you'll know from looking at the power supply, uh, the way that it uh, connects into the spectrum analyzer it uses a 37 pin um, sub D type connector. And this connects to the motherboard, which is essentially the back plane for the spectrum analyzer. And it connects into that. And the whole unit is sandwiched into the spectrum analyzer, so you can't uh, do any troubleshooting with the analyzer plugged into the unit uh, the way it's the way it's designed to go. So what I did to overcome that is I bought a uh, I think these are uh, printer cables. It was old. I, I just bought this on Amazon. I think it wasn't. It's not anything fancy, but it is a. Uh, male to female so there's one male and a one female end 
uh, 37 pin sub D. This is a straight through type cable. So uh, pin one to pin one, pin two to pin two, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no uh, crossing. I know some of these cables, they cross over uh, to do nulling and stuff. This is a straight through cable and it will plug into the uh, power supply. It just plugs in, you can tighten the screws down and then you can take this end and plug this into the spectrum analyzer. Now, uh, there's a couple of things to know when you're doing this. Of course, I was doing this for, uh, for testing purposes. So when you do that, when you, when you do this method, you're gonna take this power supply out of its normal uh, cooling airstream. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, this power supply will get, get warm and it could overheat. So things to consider when you're doing this. Um, and uh, you know, when I did, when I did run it this way, I, you know, I was able to power the spectrum analyzer. I think I remember that I had the analyzer sitting on the floor and I had this up on the bench and powered it and was able to run the analyzer. I ran it for short periods of time with this method. I didn't want to run it for any long duration time but long enough to do testing and to verify that the supply works before going through the trouble of putting it back into the unit only to find out whether it works or not. So I was able to do that. Also keep in mind too, and I talk about this in my uh, notes here, that uh, when you're working on these power supplies, these are line operated. Uh, they're straight off the uh, receptacle line. So it's a very uh, hazardous condition as far as electrical shock. Also any kind of... Um, measurements you're taking you want to make sure that your test instrument is, is is floating so it's not so you know not using um bench meters or not using uh, uh oscilloscopes that that are that are not isolated uh, you you need to make sure that you isolate this power supply before you you before you want to go scoping around if you're not using any kind of um handheld portable uh, oscilloscopes and what I used for taking readings was a uh, fluke. Uh, let me see it. Yeah, fluke 93. That's what I used for taking the readings. So fluke 93, which is a isolated battery operated 50 megahertz, I think bandwidth oscilloscope. I use those to take the readings on the power supply, and it's completely isolated, so I didn't have to worry about any kind of grounding problems. You definitely want to, don't want to blow up your oscilloscope when you're troubleshooting something. So you really got to look into that. And I'm not going to go into all of the ways to do that. If you, something you want to do, you'll need to uh, do your own research and determine the, the best way to go about it. But anyway, so that's how I was able to plug in the power supply and set it up for testing. All right, but anyway, like I said, so pictures here showing uh, how I was able to uh, fan it apart. I've got, uh, I took um, resistance readings to figure out what all the connections on the internal uh, board connections go to. Uh, I've got those on the charts there. Uh, some resistance readings that I took from uh, various points in the boards because, uh, you know, I was trying to isolate grounds uh, because I had a massive power supply failure. So I was taking resistance readings there to look for any obvious shorts that uh, that didn't make sense. And then uh, uh, some main board readings here from various uh, test points and um, some scope readings here uh, for, these are post repair uh, scope readings and they're not very clear. Um, you may or may not be able to see those on the camera. But anyway, these are post repair readings here and uh, looks like some more main board notes. Uh, anyway, all right. And then we get into the power supply. So I've got the, uh, the controller board, uh, which is the uh, small service mount board. We'll look at that in a little bit here. And there's uh, a couple, there's, looks, there's four major sections. There's a, a regulation and reference section. There's a, a main converter control section, which is here. This is all the startup control circuits and then your uh, main converter feedback portion over here, which is isolated. Uh, there's, there's a, this is an opto uh, isolator here. And the I think this transformer T301, I believe, is what supplies the standby voltage, five volts standby for the startup circuit, I believe is what that uh, little uh, transformer there is for. Uh, some of these notes in here may not be correct. There's some notes in here I made that were hypothesis type 
uh, thoughts and ideas that I had when I was troubleshooting it. So some of them may not be correct um, as I've gone and, and, and learned uh, more about this board. Picture showing the back side of the board and the front side, again, the Gavank isolations and highlighting for my uh, information, I highlighted the, the ground vias uh, so that I was able to, uh, when I was tracing out the, uh, the uh, circuits to find out, uh, to find their convenient ground points. There. Um, looks like I took some uh, power off uh, voltage readings. So these would be voltage readings when the power supply is in a standby uh, mode here and uh, the various uh, integrated circuits that were used. Uh, there's a couple of uh, LP339 in quad comparators. The, um, there's a dual flip-flop U307 that uh, is part of the, uh, feeds the current limit pin on the converter controller, which is an NE5560D uh, invert converter controller IC. Uh, there's another uh, a quad comparator. I believe those were used in the, um, startup and the uh, feet and the um, uh, protection circuits. Uh, precision reference and then a uh, five volt regulator for doing um, some regulation and throwing reference. Uh, as a, uh, another precision reference is an LT1021, uh, uh, a voltage comparator. I believe, the, I believe these circuits here, the 1021, the LM311 and the MC34072 uh, I think these and then the quad compare, I believe this is the feedback portion right here uh, that was on the um, isolated side of that uh, of that uh, feedback circuit there. And of course, no information on the opto coupler. It's a HP part number, and I did not dig too much into that one. It, you may be able to find some information. I didn't dig into that one really a whole lot. Um, some more... Uh, uh, ground readings there and these look like uh, some some more resistances on the power supply and some more resistances so this is the the overview uh, this will be the overview schematic so we talked about you know there's an ac filter section you know i mean this is and this is pretty standard uh switch mode power supply stuff although this one's a little more complex but uh you know you get your ac filter uh and your voltage uh, selection there uh, then there's your rectifier filter section here. Then there's a buck converter. And what the buck converter does is it takes your, your line volt, your line uh, DC um, off of your line, and your buck converter produces a 5 volts uh, DC. And that 5 volt DC is used to, is your main 5 volts DC that's used to supply all the digital logic. But then uh, here's where it gets a little more uh, co complex. Is, and it, then uh, the power supply takes that high, that five volts DC and switches it back through another switching transformer, and then that's where all of your uh, secondary voltages come from there. But uh, that's the way they did it here. So there's actually uh, two switching sections. The first section, the buck converter, gives you your five volts to uh, the spectrum analyzer, and then that five volts is also switched again through another transformer, and that produces all of your um, all of your uh, secondary voltages. I think there's like a plus or minus 15 volts and a 12 volts. So all of those other voltages that the spectrum analyzer needs, those, those uh, low secondary voltages are switched again. Uh, there's also a kickstart and self bias that comes in. Um, and then there's the standby supply. But anyway, kind of a big overview picture there. Here is a, some of these might be upside down too. So just uh, I'll have to flip them around here. But here's the, uh, this looks like the, uh, so this looks like the buck uh, converter here. Um, our buck uh, switching, tra our, well, our AC, DC rectifier, our filter capacitors, our filter here, and then our driver ICs for our buck converter transistor here, and then our buck converter inductor, which then produces the five volts. Uh, this looks like another... Uh, yep. So here's another overview there. And then some of the, uh, here's where I did some signal tracing on the um, controller board. This is that T301 I was telling you about on the uh, controller board here. And this looks like uh, some of the standby circuitry 
some of these values may not be correct. And again, some of this stuff, uh, anyway. So these are, like I said, all of the circuits from just tracing out where all the different traces go. And some of these might also be repeated. I may have drawings in here that I've made uh, more, uh, more, uh, more, uh, clear that it weren't so that aren't you know when you're tracing out a circuit on a circuit board they can tend to get kind of jumbled uh, so I may have redrawn some of these but anyway that looks like uh, that's the main uh, converter controller there and this looks like uh, maybe some of the feedback because there's the flip-flops that uh, 74 LS 74 chip that's on there uh, but anyway yeah so lots of these hand-drawn uh, schematics here and yep, so that's a pinout and pictures yep. uh, some more, yep. so this looks like all and then here I've also got a so I was able to find on the internet the uh, data sheet for this SE this is any slash SE five five six zero uh, switch mode power supply control circuit. And this is the main IC that, that they use in that power supply for doing that. And of course, this is the data sheet for it. So it's going to have all the information. But uh, you can sort of see how they've done on their example schematic and kind of see how I compare that to how HP has their power supply laid out uh, to see if it kind of makes sense. But anyway, like I said, all this information, I'll, uh, if, if there's enough interest uh, for it, uh, leave a comment in the comment section and if there's enough interest I'll put all this on the internet uh, in the uh, more in the more uh, section of the video more information section of the video you get this apart there's a bunch of screws uh, here these screws here these screws on top you don't want to take these out and I'll show you why but this bolts a, a heat sink to the to the chassis so these don't need to come out but these and these uh, this one down here on the end uh, needs to come out and then we'll be in the power supply there all right and so power supplies apart you'll need a uh, t8 uh, torx screw to take this unit apart and as you can see uh, it's a very uh, compact unit and it sort of sandwiches in on itself so there's a um, connector right here and it goes into this connector right here so and there's another ribbon cable right here that, that uh, feeds out to the 37 pin sub D connector that actually goes to the spectrum analyzer. Just so you, you have to sort of fold this back on itself and, and push it in like that. And then that's how it comes apart when you take it apart. So it's, it's a very um, difficult power supply if you wanna do any troubleshooting on it, just because of the way that it is designed We'll take that apart. But anyway, that's the screws that I told you not to remove. They attach this uh, heat sink to the chassis here for all of the secondary uh, low voltage regulators that are all on this heat sink right here. All right, but this is our main uh, supply right here. And I'm going to, so this looks like, uh, well, I don't know. I can't tell yet. We'll take, we'll take this apart more, and then we'll look more into uh, the power supply. All right, yeah, so this is the one that I repaired. Uh, looks like there's some a uh, little bit of rust, and it's still kind of dirty looking. But, yeah, uh, screws on the top for the uh, control board, screws up here, three screws here. Then that will allow you to slide the board out, and then you can disconnect uh, the, the connector here so you don't have to take all the uh, line uh, switch and, and plug out and we can uh, separate them so these come apart uh, again with a, a connector and now we have our controller board which is here our main uh, driver our main switch controller IC there uh, we've got uh, some voltage regulation down here and then our startup circuitry over this way this is the isolation transformer for the standby uh, supply and the way this works is there the if you this is in the service manual it talks about this there's a the line switch 
is on a five volt uh, stand standby logic supply, and it's it's powered through uh, this little standby uh, transformer here, so that when the uh, units in standby, I think it's a a logic level high, and when you turn uh, the the unit on, turn the power switch on, it drops that to a log logic level low, which sends a uh, power startup signal to actually take the main supply out of standby and start up the main supply. Like I said, all that's uh, discussed in the service manual. And then our uh, feedback uh, portion over here. And then our uh, our main board here, we've got, uh, of course, our uh, this is our AC in, in line in here. We've got our line filtering, uh, some more line filtering in here. We've got our main uh, DC uh, rectifiers, which are here. And then we've got uh, bulk filter capacitance here for our high voltage DC. I believe this uh, transistor here is for the uh, buck uh, converter and then this is the uh, rectifier for the buck converter and then this is the inductor for the uh, buck converter and then these uh, transistors here are the switching uh, transistors for the uh, for the for the push-pull converter which uh, drives this transformer here this is our uh, switching transformer here which is used to produce the secondary voltages uh, that we looked at on that uh, on that schematic. So we looked at, uh, you know, we've got our uh, buck converter, which is this portion here, and then our push-pull converter, which is this portion here. And uh, of course the drive for this is, uh, well, the drive for all of this is on the, um, the uh, controller board here. But uh, yeah, and like I said, uh, when I had to repair the unit, yeah, so these, yeah, this is definitely the one I repaired. Um, there's, so I replaced, it uh, looks like I replaced these with uh, IR, uh, IRF 7740Bs, and that's probably because that's what I have. I have a whole bunch of these. Uh, I believe the original part number was a, uh, it's a, it was a Motorola part. Yeah, so they were originally, they were Motorola MTP uh, five N four zero E's, uh, which were the uh, power FETs, and uh, it looks like I purchased some, but I didn't install them. So I put these uh, IRF seven forty B's in, and I guess they worked fine. And then these uh, switch controllers here. Uh, let's see if I can put some put some light on those. Just so yeah, FETs there, replacement FETs, and the switch controllers here were also replaced, and I think I just got those from uh, Mauser. They were they were parts that were readily available. But yeah, and of course, and then this uh, uh, TP100. This is for the um, right here. This TP100 is for the uh, standby, uh, the uh, or not the standby, but the kick the kickstart and self bias circuit, uh, which is right here on this portion right here. So there's a, a rectifier and a test point here. And then we'll look at the, uh, so this is the low voltage, uh, standby portion. This is all pretty straightforward. It's, it's, I didn't trace any of this out. Um, but, uh, essentially what this is, is, uh, there's rectifiers or diodes uh, and, uh, linear regulators. They're just, uh, looks like a pretty standard regulator, three terminal regulators. I see a LM340 and I see a LM337. So that'd be a negative regulator and a couple of other parts these are diodes here so so anyway well uh this portion here uh is going to be all of your low voltage power supply regulation circuits one more thing to look at before uh we wrap this video up uh, i just wanted to point this out too so we looked at the power supply and we talked about uh the documentation or the lack thereof of documentation and one thing i did find and i don't remember how i found this but uh this is information from the service manual for the HP 85644A, which is a, a standalone tracking generator for the 8560 series spectrum analyzers. And those are the ones that I believe were the predecessor of the 8590 series spectrum analyzers. But I found the power supply was, was very uh, similar uh, in its layout in that it uh, had uh, broken out the same way. There's a line rectifier followed by a buck regulator 
that uh, is accurately controlled for five volts. Uh, then there's a DC to DC converter and then linear uh, post regulators and then uh, control circuitry. So, and this uh, service manual goes into uh, actual detail. So I think HP actually made, uh, may have actually made these power supplies for this unit uh, because they break down the operation uh, in, into more detail. And they talk about um, uh, the buck regulator operation, the DC to DC converter, uh, and then the post regulators. Now they're not, uh, it's not ex exactly the same, but it's, it's very uh, similar. Uh, also they uh, talk about the kickstart and bias. And uh, here's some more. And I believe that uh, uh, they they go into explaining why uh, this layout where they use a buck regulator followed by a switching regulator. I think they talk about it. And I think that's uh, where I kind of got the idea that they do this to protect the downstream unit from, from catastrophic damage uh, if a power supply failure occurs, I believe is why they do it. They use that layout. So to give it a little more uh, power supply, a little more uh, safety, as far as protecting the instrument. Uh, but they talk about uh, the overprotection, uh, which it uses uh, similar, we looked at that uh, uh, power supply, but there's a thermistor attached to the uh, buck uh, switching transistor. There's a thermistor on the heat sink and that's used to protect the power supply from over voltage or over temperature condition there. And then it talks about uh, some power cycles. But anyway, so yeah, that information is there. And I think I actually made some drawings uh, from the, yeah, so these are drawings of that uh, power supply unit there. So again, very similar layout, and they go into some of the control of how that works. Uh, looks like they use a little bit different uh, uh, ICs, and so they use an LT1021, so that's the same, but an MC3400. Uh, but anyway, this looks like the feedback, and they also use in that power supply the same any 5560 switch mode controller for the uh, for the uh, DC to DC converter controller. I don't know if it mentions that in here or not. But anyway, uh, if you're going to do uh, some real in-depth troubleshooting on your power supply for your spectrum analyzer might be a good read to take a look in the service manual and that was for the HP 85644A 85645A series tracking generators. Take a look at that service manual in the power supply section where it talks about uh, how it works because it might be some good read to help you understand how the power supplies work in the 8590 series of spectrum analyzers. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this video. Um, again, uh, not the video that I necessarily wanted to make, but one that I thought uh, would be good. Uh, you know, uh, I, I guess Murphy has it set out for me on spectrum analyzers because now this is the second one I've had to repair. But anyway, uh, I'm going to look in some more into the... Um, the calibrating the attenuator on that uh, on that spectrum analyzer, see if there's something I can do to get back my um, my attenuator cal data uh, or correction data for uh, for that analyzer, or if there's some way to recreate it. Now, I also looked on the clip. I mentioned I had the clip of the 8590 series spectrum analyzers, and there is a separate manual for calibration. And I did not look at that, um, so I'm going to look into that also because that also uh, that may have some information in there as far as doing uh, calibration on the unit. I'll see what that says. I don't know if it has a uh, way to um, calibrate it without the correction constants. But uh, anyway, if I figure anything out, then I will definitely do a video and let everyone know uh, because it's probably I'm probably not the only one that's lost their calibration data. But that being said. If you have one of these spectrum analyzers, back up your calibration data. Um, I thought I did. I remember doing it, but I don't know where the data is. So anyway, uh, that's the way it is for, for me anyways. But uh, anyways, uh, stay tuned. Stick around. Uh, I know it's been a while. It's It's been summertime. I've been busy uh, vacationing with the family, 
travel and do that sort of stuff. But now it's getting back into the fall, uh, back into work. And uh, so I'll be putting out, uh, I'll be probably putting out some more videos here in the, uh, in the near future. I've got some more repair videos to, to put out uh, on some equipment I've, I've acquired over the summer. And I've also got uh, my project that I've been working on since the November of last year that is very near completion. Um, I'm just doing some final uh, testing and tweaking and uh, hopefully to have that finished so that I can present that uh, as like a show and tell type video. Uh, massive construction project for me. Uh, probably the biggest construction project that I've had to date uh, and just acquiring parts and uh, working and design and rework uh, and layout and all the stuff that I've learned along the way with that project. But anyway, I uh, hope to get that out soon and some more videos to come. But that's all for now. Thank you for watching. If you like the channel, uh, subscribe or whatever. But uh, anyway, definitely stay tuned. There'll be more to come. Thanks.